G'day everyone and welcome back to another live stream here at the Australian Reptile Park. Now today's going to be really special, I'm going to show you a really unique lizard species, an exotic lizard species that happens to be uh, venomous, so I'll talk to you about that in, in a few moments. I'm also going to try and feed this lizard today, so hopefully he, he does a good job. So make sure you tune in and enjoy uh, our talk about Gila Monsters. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in and watching our live streams every day. I hope they've been as fun for you as it has been for us doing them. Uh, and make sure you tune in to watch Animal Tales with Tim Faulkner on his Facebook page as well. Alright, it's the weekend and I'm very excited because I'm about to show you a Gila Monster. Now, this is one of the world's true venomous lizards. Uh, it's a lizard that's not found here in Australia. They're not endemic to this country at all. They're actually found in southwest United States of America and Mexico as well. Now they're not a massive lizard which you're about to see, but again, they are venomous. Now when most people think of venomous animals, they, they'll quickly think of a snake of course, that's probably the most obvious one, but this is an actual uh, venomous lizard. But you can see in this kind of environment how relaxed this animal is, and even in the wild, bites from this particular animal are quite rare. Now I'm going to come down nice and close and hopefully get the camera in there as well. Now. Heloderms make up a family of lizards called of the, of the, of the different heloderms are your Gila monster and also your Mexican beaded lizards. And in terms of their relationship with other lizard species, they're more closely related uh, to your varanid species, so your monitor species. But really, if you're familiar with monitors, animals like a parenti or a lace monitor, of course, the most iconic uh, varanid species of all, the Komodo dragon. This is a much shorter, stockier, sluggish version of a, of, a, of a monitor lizard. So this is your heloderms. Uh, now gila monsters are venomous and a little bit different to a snake that is venomous. So if you think of a brown, eastern brown snake, front frame venomous snakes, which has venom glands on either side of its head, uh, one single duct that tracks down to a fang, and that's how they induce their venom into a prey item. A little bit different for a Gila monster. So Gila monster venom glands are multi-lobed. When they bite down, the activation and the tension in their gums will start to excrete that venom. Their sharp teeth will release that venom as well into the prior. But it's still debated in science whether that venom uh, evolved as a way to avoid being predated on, so as a defense mechanism, when generally venom in an animal is more related to subjugation of prey and also in aiding in digestion, which I'm sure this lizard would do as well. So this particular species in the wild is primarily gonna feed on things like quail, uh, eggs in particular, uh, but also on small mammals like rabbits. But they raid nests. So when it's warm during spring and summer, they will move around, they will get inside a nest and they prey on animals that aren't really going to fight back at all. So you've got to think, while they have a venom apparatus, if the animal's not going to defend itself, that kind of goes back to that theory that the Gila monster developed venom as a way to defend themselves. If you're bitten by a Gila monster, and this is as a human, the animal's going to bite down really hard, the muscle contractions are going to activate, and obviously they're going to start to produce that venom. Now that venom is immediately going to encourage swelling, but also localised pain. It's going to be extremely painful. And what happens when you experience pain is you think twice about trying to ever go near that animal again. Now whether that's a human or a potential predatory species, if they're bitten by a Gila monster, they are going to feel that excruciating pain, and they're certainly going to think twice about trying to predate on an animal that looks similar uh, to this. Now Gila monsters, they grow pretty similar to the size of something like a shingleback skink that you'd have in Australia. They max out at around 35 centimetres long. Mexican beaded lizards typically can grow uh, a little bit larger than your Gila monsters, but they're not a massive lizard. And particularly for the Gila monsters, they're primarily terrestrial. So they move around on the ground. They have a home range of between five and six hectares, particularly for the males. And they will move for anywhere up to 500 metres in a day to look for food. Now they're also, because they're a reptile, they have a really low metabolic rate, particularly when they're at rest, which means they don't require to intake anywhere near as much food that a mammal would of the same size. In fact, you only really in captivity need to feed your Gila monster maybe once or twice a month, and that's it. Now I'm gonna pick him up so you can get the camera nice and close uh, and see a few of his really the cool things about Gila monsters. Now, you'll see that tongue flicking out, and this is where you're going to see that relationship with your varanid species. 
They have a forked tongue. They have highly advanced chemosensory skills. So they use that forked tongue to pick up scent particles. Now you can imagine if they're a nest raiding species, they use that tongue, they pick up a scent, they find the nest, they eat their poo. It really is as simple as that. But another thing you'll see is those hard raised scales. Just like a lot of our monitor species that we have here in Australia, they have these tiny little bony plates underneath that top epidermal layer of skin. They're called osteoderms. Now, if you ever see a Gila monster under an x-ray, it's one of the most beautiful things you'll ever see as you see all those hard raised scales. Now, with Gila derms as well, your Gila monsters, uh, they actually uh, perform what is called ritualized combat. Now, what I mean by that is males will fight each other. So they generally start to combat in around April as it starts to warm up as, as, as autumn finishes in America and then it does start to warm a little bit. They will, as the days start to warm, the males will venture outside of their dens, they will encounter other males and they will perform at length ritualised combat. Males have been observed in the wild combating for up to three hours non-stop, combating multiple times. Now what they do when they combat, a little bit different to our, our varanid species which you'll see stand up on their back tail and fight chest to chest, instead the males will intertwine with themselves. Basically what they're trying to do is fold the other male over and get in that dominant position. Now it's a really important part of the whole breeding cycle for a Gila monster. They fight, the males start to fight, after that you have your dominant male and then he will go out and mate with females. Now when they mate with a female Gila monster, typically she'll lay a small clutch of two to three eggs and anywhere between four to five months after that, tiny little Gila monsters will hatch out of an egg. But they really are just fascinating animals to see and work this closely with. Now what I'm going to do is I've got a little bit of food over there. I'm going to see if we can get the Gila monster to eat. Alright, so we've got a little bit of chicken on the menu today. We should smell it. There we go. And you get that camera in nice and close there. Now if we let this Gila monster chew down repetitively, you would see saliva and of course venom start to produce underneath, uh, underneath the head there. Now obviously this prey item is already deceased, so there's no real purpose for that to really bite down and chew. Uh, and that's how they've done a lot of the venom testing for Gila monsters in terms of, 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 of tracking how venomous they are. So I've got another bit of food here. They generally take their time when they're feeding, but they can move a little bit quicker than people expect. Whilst they are quite sluggish most of the time, on a really warm day, particularly if they're optimal body temperature is closer to 30 degrees and above, uh, they can move a little bit quicker. I've spent a bit of time in the southern part of Arizona looking for Gila monsters, walking around through the desert where they're found. Uh, you can see that reaction to my hand there. Now he's starting to come towards me, but I'm going to give him the chicken of course. Here we go. We'll get him to move a little bit. Hey, lift that head up. There we go. Alright, so we'll get him that last bit. Before he walks off the table, I might bring him back this way. And you can eat that last little bit of chicken if you get that camera in there. Now, heliderms have a very old lineage. It dates back to around 80 million years ago. And, and fossils of heliderma suspectum, the one we're looking at today, the helimos, that goes back to about 10,000 years ago for the most recent uh, fossil records of this particular species. They're an amazing animal and unfortunately, due to habitat loss and degradation in the southern part of the states in particular, there has been a decline in Gila monster populations and they are considered a, a vulnerable species and they are an animal in need of conservation. What's cool about Gila monster venom in particular is it's even been used to help treat diabetes, which is amazing to think that an animal that is venomous and has the potential to cause harm also has the ability to help us if we are sick. So derivatives from the peptides of Gila monster have been used uh, in treating uh, uh, diabetes. Alright, Dan, do you want to answer some questions about this Gila monster? Yeah, of course. I might uh, bring him out of it again. I'll just wait till he's eating his food. But yeah, go for it. Where does the name come from? Oh, that's such a good question. So Gila monsters named, they're named where they'll taxonomically de de describe uh, from the Gila River in New Mexico and Arizona. So that's where the name Gila monster comes from. Now a lot of people uh, will pronounce them Gila monster or Gila monster. No, the G is silent, so it's Gila monster. Are they found anywhere in Australia? No, so they're not a native species to Australia. They're not an endemic species to this country. Uh, their range is 
the southwestern side of the state, so you're talking about places like uh, w uh, Western California, Arizona, uh, the, uh, right on the western side of New Mexico, and then down through uh, the coast of uh, Mexico itself, what the happens, western side. What happens if you get envenomated by one? The problem with a bite from a Gila monster, now really, whilst they are venomous, they're a very easy animal to work with. Even though this animal right now is feeding, uh, you can see how relaxed it is. I can touch it, I can pick it up, and it doesn't really try and bite. But in saying that, if it does bite down on me, I'm going to feel excruciating pain. Also, too, uh, localised swelling. So a bite from a Gila monster uh, would be quite detrimental in terms of the pain you're going to feel. It's highly unlikely that that bite in a fully fit human is going to kill you, but it would not be something that you would want to experience. Now, in the wild, to get bitten by a Gila monster is almost impossible. The people that get bitten by Gila monsters are people trying to catch them, uh, or if you keep them as pets, and unfortunately, sometimes, uh, just like I say, the tamest dog in the world can bite, uh, same thing for a Gila monster. So the majority of bites that have occurred have been captive animals rather than their wild counterparts, because they are so difficult to come across, particularly because they are so cryptic. What do their scales feel like? Okay, so hard and raised. Now, to, if you wanted to touch an animal that uh, feels similar, you would probably need to feel a, one of our monitor species in Australia because they do also have those hard raised scales and those osteoderms underneath their scales. Now, it actually feels like another animal that we have at the park too, called a tegu or a tegu, which most people would be familiar with as well. But yes, hard and raised, quite bumpy. Uh, even underneath, they're quite bumpy as well. Uh, and even on the head there as well, you can still see those really high raised scales on the head there. How old can they get? Okay, so this particular Gila monster is over 20 years old. Uh, they've been recorded to live up to 40 years of age. And I guess if you understand, they do have a low metabolic rate. They are a reptile. Living for 40 years is not a surprise at all. Extending that life in captivity is not a surprise at all as well. So I have no reason why to think this animal won't live here for another 20 years potentially. How big can they get? How big can you get? So the Gila monster we're looking at right now is fully grown. He's an, he's an adult male. Uh, maxed out at about 35, maybe centimetres, maybe a little bit longer. They don't get quite large or as bulky as their very close relatives, uh, the beaded lizard. They're not a massive lizard at all. But in saying that too, you're talking anywhere between 35 to 40 centimetres, absolute maximum, but very similar in size to something like an eastern blue tongue lizard. Obviously, our eastern blue tongue lizards aren't venomous though, whereas the Gila monster is. Are there any other venomous lizards? Yeah, so with your beaded lizards and your Gila monsters, they are always considered the true venomous lizards. But if you think of their relationships with the varanoids as a whole, that play, your, your, your varanid species, so your monitors, uh, research has been done with those animals to suggest they are venomous as well. So outside of your Gila monster and your beaded lizard, your things like your Komodo dragons, Parentes, lace monitors. Uh, maybe one last question. Do they have much colour variation? Yeah. Not so much once they reach their adult size. Uh, there is two subspecies of Gila, of Gila monster, and they, they can vary a little bit more so in pattern. One is banded, the other one is reticulated in its pattern. But when they're juveniles, they can have a much more yellow colour to them in particular. So yellow and quite prominent in the black markings. As they get older, they do kind of fade into this dull pink and black colour. But yeah, not too much colour variation uh, as a whole, but generally in the pattern, particularly between the different colour variations of Gila Monster, they can be quite different. Alright, so that is my beautiful little Gila Monster. I hope you've enjoyed another live stream here at the park. Fascinating animal to work with. I'm very, very lucky to do this. He's got his tongue hanging out there. We hope you keep tuning into our live streams. I'm going to put him back so he can finish off his chicken. Hope you enjoyed that and we'll see you next time here at the Reptile Park. See you later. How was that, buddy?